add these five power foods to your diet and they might just kick your health into overdrive. Welcome to the Exam Room Live Health All-Stars series brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I'm the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for watching and downloading in more than 150 countries around the world and making the Exam Room one of the most downloaded nutrition podcasts anywhere on the planet today. This is in fact episode three of our Health All-Stars series and Today, we will be looking at five amazing foods that you should be focusing on every single day. And with the shopping list for your health is world-renowned gastroenterologist, best-selling author, and the king of good gut health, Dr. Will Bolsowitz is here with us today. We're also going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag for him to answer your questions. So if there's something you would like to ask Dr. B, here's your chance. Just post your question in the comments or in the chat, and we will get to as many as we can here on the show today. And with that, we welcome the author of Fiber Fuel, the Prince of Poop and a good friend to the show, Dr. Will Bolsowitz. My man, happy new year, happy 2023. Great to see you again. Great to see you, Chuck. Happy new year to you, to everyone else who's here. Thank you so much for being here. I'm very excited. And by the way, I just want to give a quick shout out. I'm seeing in the comments section, some really cool people. Kelly Vollmer is currently taking my Microbiome 21 program, which started on January 1st. And Monica Anderson has been talking to her about it and like is providing words of support. So I, I just want to say like, you guys, th th you are my people. I'm so happy to be here. It's that <laughs> sense of community. Words, it doesn't happen with me often, Chuck. It's so cool, right? That sense of community. I feel the exam exact way about the exam roomies who have built these relationships and they tune in every time that we go live and, you know, just to, to see this community that we've built here and, and with your microbiome courses, I, you know, it really is. When I say it's one of the most downloaded and most powerful podcasts on the planet, it's for a reason. It's because we really are improving the health of people on a global level. It's the same way for your courses, man. Yeah, it's it's actually uh, amazing to me when like, let me just give you a quick example. We're sitting here right now and I'm seeing people in the comments section who are talking about I'm in Germany right now, like I'm in places around the globe. Let's check in everyone, wherever you are, you're coming to us live right now. Pop into the comments and tell us where you are coming from. And let's just celebrate the fact that we're all here together in 2023. We made it. Yeah. <laughs> Health unity for the win. All right, man. So while people are doing a roll call, roll call for us in the chat, let's go ahead and dive into these five foods to really maximize gut health here in 2023. Number one on the list is going to make a lot of people who aren't necessarily fans of the morning a lot happier about getting out of bed. Number one for you is amped up coffee. When you're talking about amped up coffee, what are you talking about? All right. Well, coffee at baseline, let me just say, if we talk about coffee, black coffee, it's actually, believe it or not, good for your gut. Black coffee actually contains soluble fiber, believe it or not. There's, there's more soluble fiber than you would believe. And there's also polyphenols that help to feed the gut microbiome. Both of these are prebiotic. And our research has shown, including research from Zoe, has shown that people who regularly consume coffee it enhances the growth of beneficial gut microbes. So coffee at baseline is good. Um, what I want is I want to take it to the next level. Like good, cool. Let's do great. Let's do even better. And the way that we approach this is by amping up our coffee with spices. Spices are not talked about enough. I mean, I know there are other people talking about spices, but they're, they're not talked about enough. Because there's such a ripe opportunity to enhance our, our health, our gut health. And an example of this is if you take your coffee and you quite simply, let me just say, like, I am not a, um, I'm not a precision cook. I am the kind of guy that I'm just like grabbing stuff and throwing them in. So, but what I like to do is throw a sprinkle of turmeric and ginger and cinnamon into my coffee, give it a mix give it a taste, see where it's at, add a little more if I want to. And often I will sort of uh, balance it with some soy milk, organic soy milk. And this combination, you can add some stevia to it if you want to. This combination is number one, delicious. But number two, 
you could go down the line, turmeric, anti-inflammatory, ginger, anti-inflammatory, great for the gut, improves nausea. Cinnamon actually shows benefits for metabolism, for diabetes. We're talking about things that you want. Coffee at baseline is great. Coffee with turmeric, ginger, and cinnamon is even better. Let's do it. There you go. That proprietary blend. I know you when you go to Starbucks. We were talking about this. I think that maybe the last time you were on the show is that blend of spices that you take with you instead of relying on the barista. Because one of the tips that you gave on that particular episode was like, look, you know, if you ask for any kind of anything added to your drink, odds are, even if you're not expecting it, it's probably going to contain sugar that you may not want. Yeah, that's actually very true. So we have to be careful about this. So like, look, I'm a loyal Starbucks customer and I also wrote both of my books at Starbucks. But when you go to Starbucks, like I'm a huge fan of matcha tea. If I were to add a number six to this list, matcha tea is not in the five because I have coffee. But if I were to add a six, I would add matcha tea. Matcha green tea is so good for our gut. It's got this phytochemical called EGCG um, that helps to support a healthy gut microbiome. But that's matcha tea in isolation. When you take matcha tea and you start blending it with sugar, we're paying a price that we don't need to pay. Matcha tea is good by itself. And when you go to Starbucks, the problem is like you can't order matcha tea without them including sugar. It's it's already pre-mixed so that their baristas like, can quite simply grab a scoop, throw it in, rather than having to do a scoop of sugar, a scoop of green tea. They, they put it together. But you know, there's customers like me and the exam roomies we just want the green tea. We don't need the sugar that comes with it. So we just have to be careful when we go to these conventional coffee shops in the way that they prepare our food. Absolutely. Number two on the list is another one that I know that you're big on, and it would not surprise me in the least if you had something going right now, not far off camera. Fermented foods. This makes the list. Why? Chuck, do we need to take my, my do I need to like, you know, uh, pick up the the computer and carry it downstairs and show you what's happening in the laboratory downstairs? Because well, let's the... see. Let's see the crowd. Let's see the crowd. <laughs> um, so anyway, all right. Uh, fermented food. Fermented food. Um, fermented food is there. There is new research emerging that is showing us the benefits of fermented food. And I'm going to start with the research and then I'm going to tell you why. Study out of Stanford University, a couple of people that I know, some of them, some of whom I work with at Zoe, um, professors Christopher Gardner, Justin Sonnenberg. And in this study, they took a group of people and they asked them, because they basically were not eating fermented food. The average American is not eating fermented food. And they said to them, increase your fermented food intake to several servings per day. By the way, a serving is a rather small amount. Like, so for example, if we're talking about sauerkraut, we're literally talking about a couple bites of sauerkraut. We're not talking about a big bowl. So increase your fermented food intake and let's see what happens to your microbiome. And what they discovered is 10 weeks into the study, 10 weeks, this is not a lot of time. People had increased diversity of their microbiome and the measures of inflammation within their gut decreased. So now what's going on here? What's going on here is that fermented food is more than just probiotics. Probiotics are the living microbes. This is these fermented foods. Like if I were to bring in my sauerkraut kraut jar, I would describe this gar of, jar of sauerkraut as an ecosystem. All right. And within that ecosystem, there is a balance of microbes and they're hard at work. But what they're doing is they're transforming the food. It started as cabbage, and a week to two weeks later, it's now sauerkraut. It's a different taste. It's the it's got the acidity to it, and this is because they're making this transformation. And in the process of transforming it, they are unlocking vitamins. They're unlocking um, uh, in, uh, other forms of fiber and polyphenols and other nutrients that are of benefit to us. So now. Every time I talk about fermented food, I appreciate that people have concerns about, for example, salt intake. I know that's the first question that people have. Look, if you are the average American who is eating tons of ultra processed foods that are high in salt because salt is a preservative for those foods, if you are that American, we need to reduce your salt intake first. And the way that we do that is by eating a whole food plant-based diet. But if you are the person who is eating a whole food plant-based diet, I, I would like to inform you that salt is a required part of your diet. You're going to have to have some salt in your diet. I am not asking you to consume an amount of salt that is excessive. 
I'm asking you within the context of your whole food plant-based diet to consume a small amount of these fermented foods on a routine basis because they're actually beneficial to you. And when you're doing it within that context, you're not consuming an excessive amount of salt. All right. If you, if somebody put you on the spot and they said, all right, well, what's better sauerkraut, kimchi or something else, what would you tell them? Well, I kind of see the sauerkraut and kimchi as being quite similar to one another, to be honest with you, Chuck. I mean, if I'm forced, gosh, don't, don't be attacking my Polish heritage like this. This is very difficult for me. I am. I Global am impact, proud, baby. Global I'm, impact. Yeah, I'm a proud Polish American, but the problem is that if I'm forced to choose between kimchi and, um, sauerkraut for purely health benefits, I would probably go with the kimchi. And the reason why is because sauerkraut tends to be a quite simple formula. Uh, you know, you can create great sauerkraut with just cabbage, salt, and water, and you can add some garlic or some other things to it. But kimchi tends to be uh, more of a, a, a tradition-based and geographically diverse and unique formula that in, will involve many different forms of, of, uh, of plants. And so like Napa cabbage may be the foundation, but then you're gonna have peppers and all the things that you throw in there. So give me the diversity of plants. I'll take that. Yeah. But I mean, it kind of goes to what you were saying though. You just kind of can't go wrong at the end of the day, right? You can't go wrong. And you know, I think that like, look, what I'm saying here is we're not eating fermented food and there's tons of ripe opportunities. So the other day, Chuck, I got so excited because for my son for lunch, we're talking Tuesday. Uh, I made a smashing tempeh lettuce tomato and avocado you don't need the mayo you use the avocado instead and then a delicious tempeh that's got the smokiness of the bacon with um lettuce and tomato yo like that's a fermented food you get points for this tempeh counts miso counts if you want to do a little kombucha a little kombucha add some water to it to sort of dilute it out these are all great options Giddy up, man. I love to hear that. Um, before we move on to number three on the list, let me go ahead and share this from Teak Birch at 1208. This is why we do the show. This is what we were talking about at the top. This is Teak. I'm 72 years of age and went 100% whole food plant-based SOS free two years ago. Have never felt better. Thank you so much for the podcasts and videos. It turned my life around for the best. 72. It is never too late. People think when you get in your 40s, your 50s, eh, you're over the hill already. Not even remotely close. Look at this, Dr. B. 72. Never felt better. Okay. First of all, talking about people in their 40s like they're over the hill is giving me a midlife crisis. Oh, we're crap. I'm in my 40s now, too. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck, we're not that old, man. I feel like, you know, we're we're basically a half a step after college still. Yeah, man. So, um, look, honestly, 72 years old isn't that old either. You have a lot of great years in front of you. I I'm just going to publicly share my personal goal. I'm not going to be ridiculous and obnoxious and say I'm going to live to 130 like some absurd people out there. But I will say this. When I'm in my 80s and my 90s, I want to be mentally sharp. And I want to be out there on the dance floor. Like with my grandkids, my great grandkids, I want to be out there on the dance floor, cutting a rug, having fun. One of my grandkids gets married. Yo, guess who's starting the party? That would be me. <laughs> in my 80s, I'm still I can still cut a rug. Dude, that's epic, man. That's that. Make sure I get an invite. You teach me how to dance, I'll get out there and cut it up with you, man. Bro, we'll be out there together and we'll be we'll all be holding hands and doing like a traditional dance, a traditional Polish dance, and then I'll do the thing where I like Maybe that's not Polish, but I'll do the thing where I'll like get down and start doing the kicks, you know? <laughs> you would be an inspiration to millions if you're able to do that in your 80s, man. I mean, just let, let's just do it. And that is a realistic goal. You're not talking about living to be Methuselah's age, man. You're talking about a realistic goal here. So let's make it happen, dude. I'm a very goal-oriented person, and you're giving me 40 years to work on this. I think it's going to happen. You got this. You got this. All right. Number three on the list before we open up the doctor's mailbag, because we do have a lot of questions here. Sprouts. Talk to us about sprouts and why you love them so much. Okay. So fermentation, I, I was mentioning earlier, fermentation is about transformation. Guess what else is about transformation? Sprouts. They're incredible. Um, you can take either a vegetable-based seed or you can take a legume. They can both be sprouted. Sprouting is quite simply germination. Germination is the initial step in a plant starting to mature and develop into something bigger. 
um, when it goes from a seed into now it's starting to open up and come to life. And when the germination process is taking place, when we are sprouting, we are increasing our fiber content dramatically. We are increasing our protein content dramatically. We are unlocking vitamins and we're actually um, making available nutrients that like in some cases, they're more available in sprout form than you would see in other places. There is this element of almost a medicinal quality to sprouts. And the amazing thing about sprouts, here's, here's the thing about it that's crazy. One of the criticisms of a plant-based diet, and I understand where this comes from. One of the criticisms is that people say it's too expensive. It's not accessible, right? What if you live in a food desert? I get that. There's a lot of truth to what they're saying. But let's talk about sprouts. Sprouts are non-perishable, meaning I'm saying seeds and legumes that sit in your pantry for an entire year. They are non-perishable. They are not expensive. I mean, how, may, how much does like dried beans cost? You can get them organic, even though uh, uh, you can get them organic. And frankly, they're not that expensive, even in organic form. And when you sprout them, you are creating a garden in your kitchen, on your countertop. It takes typically one square foot of space. You can have the smallest apartment in New York City. You can have a sprout garden. And when you consume them after anywhere from, say, three to seven days, depending on what sprout we're talking about, when you consume them, you are consuming food at its freshest possible point. So we are talking about extremely inexpensive food that is hyper nourishing and as good as it gets from uh, uh, a health perspective, and I would argue also a gut health perspective. I mean, we Chuck, we could do a 45-minute episode on Sprouts alone. I love them. I think that we should. I think that that gives us a great idea for February, man. Why not? We'll make February the Sprout Month. Um, speaking of sprouting things, Patty at 1218 is wondering whether you can possibly sprout dry lentils. So uh, lentils start, you, you're not going to sprout the canned lentils. That's not going to work. Um, they have to be dried lentils, but, but what I would say though, is that I want to make sure the people who understand if, if you've never done sprouting before, um, there are some resources that I have completely free. You can go to my Instagram and look for stuff that I've done with Doug Evans. You can go frankly to Doug Evans account and he shares quite a bit on sprouts or this book that's over my shoulder right here, the fiber fields cookbook. I have an entire chapter about sprouts and I teach you step-by-step step how to actually create sprouts because I actually think this is an important part of a gut healthy diet. You're not going to want to go to your store and buy these seeds. Like you're not going to want to go to Lowe's and buy seeds, broccoli seeds. You're not going to want to go to your store and buy lentils or black beans and then take them home and sprout them. That's not the way that we should be doing this. The right way to do this is to buy this from a specified sprout purveyor where they actually are number one, checking them for high germination rate. High germination rate basically means that like these are designed for you to get maximum number of sprouts. Number two, that they're actually going to um, confirm that there are no pathogens. So typically when these seeds are being sold to you for consumption through sprouting before they actually um, sell them to you, if it's a sprouting purveyor, they're going to actually check them to make sure there's no E. coli or anything of that variety. And the third thing is that we want them organic and it can be hard to find organic at a typical uh, supermarket. So you buy them off the internet and you can buy them in bulk. Like, I'm not kidding. You could get an entire canister this big, like five pounds of dried lentils. They will last you all year. They will not be very expensive. And you will have tons. You have sprouts for like the entire year on a daily basis with this canister. Check this out. A couple of uh, more exam roomy longevity all-stars here in the chat with us today. Karen says, my goal is still to do a full Asian squat as I get into my 80s. She says, 64 is the new 40. And then I love this one. Willie Cat, 40s is like kindergarten. I'm 75 on a whole food plant-based diet, still playing the keys in a praise band. They think I'm 50. How about that? I mean, that's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. Yeah. And, you know, this is, uh, I'm not surprised because we're, we're talking like people make an anti-aging so complicated. It's not that complicated. Quite simply, when you eat plants, fiber, polyphenols, phytochemicals, these are the elements that plants have a monopoly on. 
and they're anti-aging. The more plants that you're consuming, the better. Look good, feel good, play those keys well into your days. Number four on the list, omega-3 super seeds. Talk to us about this because especially when you're eating a plant-based diet, a lot of people get tripped up about omega-3 sources. Yeah. So, okay. Well, first of all, I think uh, entering into this conversation about omega-3s, omega-3s are anti-inflammatory fats. We need or omega-3s and um, we're actually required to get them through our diet. Like our body can't produce them for us. In fact, there's no animal on the planet that produces omega-3s, including salmon. People hear, oh, eat your salmon for your omega-3s. And they have to understand all omega-3s come from plants, all of them. When you eat salmon for the omega-3s, you're eating them because the salmon are storing the omega-3s in their fat, but they got the omega-3s by eating plants. So there's a couple of different types of omega-3s, ALA, DH, DHA, and EPA. DHA and EPA are the ones that we tend to be more concerned about getting. When we eat the seeds, we're eating them as ALA, and then our body has the ability to convert them into DHA and EPA. Now, I, I know there's going to be some people in the comment section that are going to like kind of attack that statement I just made. So I will unpack that more in a moment. But before we do that, let me just say that plant-based sources of omega-3s should be a part of every single diet on the planet. The reason why is because they're intensely healthy. They include the plant-based ALA omega-3. And it's not just the only nutrient in there. You also have the fiber and all the other benefits. As an example, ground flax contains isoflavones that have been associated with reduced risk of hormonal cancers. That's breast cancer for women and prostate cancer for men. By the way, those are the top two causes of cancer death for men and women. That's flax. Flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds. I love all three. And frankly, if I were making a smoothie right now, Chuck, you would see me pouring all three of these things into that blender as that smoothie is buzzing because I want them in there. Um, now, all this being said, should we be increasing our chia flax and hemp? The answer is yes. Is this for everyone? The answer is yes. Everyone should be increasing their chia flax and hemp. Do we need a supplement? Do we need a DHA and EPA supplement? Well, first of all, we can get DHA and EPA in a more pure form from an algae-based omega-3. Again, the source of these omega-3s is always plants. So let's go to the source, algae-based omega-3. I personally believe that people should be making uh, omega-3s such a priority that almost all of us, not just vegans, almost all of us benefit from a DHA and EPA supplement. I believe that that's the truth. Um, so it's there's no uh, formal recommendation by any society that says that vegans are under an obligation to take a DHA and EPA supplement. I just think that it's a nutrient that we want to make sure we get it right. And taking a supplement is a way for us to ensure that we're, like, that's sort of the role of supplements to ensure that this nutrient, we're taking care of it. Well, Terry is another long life exam roomie all-star here, striving uh, to go a long, long time, says, I'm 63 and I feel like I'm just out of college. Goes right back to what it was we were talking about. I love that. And it gives me hope for when I'm 63, I'm still feeling the exact way that I do now, man, because I feel like, I mean, I feel like I'm in high school again, you know? I, I shot my 20s because I was in such poor health. I feel like I'm getting to relive them now. It's It's really kind of fun. Uh, let's recap the top five or what we've got so far before we hit the fifth and final food on your list. We came in with amped up coffee. Phenomenal. Then we hit fermented foods. Then we had sprouts. We just talked about omega-3 super seeds and number five on the list is kiwis. The, yeah. The cover of your book, kiwis. man. How could I not? This was the inspiration for the cover of Fiberfield. We're blowing up a kiwi. Like <laughs> what, a, what a what a classic South Carolina redneck I have become down here, blowing up stuff on the cover of my of my book. Um, but you know what's interesting about kiwis? They they actually are a great source of fiber. But there's something unique about kiwis as well. They um, have proven to be wonderful for having a good, healthy bowel movement. 
And if you follow me, then you know I'm a big believer in having good, regular, complete, and dare I say, satisfying evacuations on a routine basis. I'm a huge fan of this. And guess what helps us to accomplish this? All of us, no matter who we are, whether we're constipated, not constipated, doesn't matter. Guess what helps us to have good, healthy, complete, satisfying evacuations? Kiwis. Research indicates that by simply eating two kiwis per day, you can actually improve constipation. But on the flip side, like I eat kiwis on a routine basis and it's not like it gives you diarrhea if you have normal healthy bowel movements. It just makes them even better. So to me, like this is a clearly a gut health food when we have something that is demonstrating to be so beneficial in terms of the health of our bowel movements. And at the end of the day, they just taste good. I mean, you really can't go wrong with a good old fashioned kiwi. What is kiwi season, by the way? I mean, obviously that's not really a native fruit to the U.S., I wouldn't think. But what is kiwi season? Is there an optimal time of year to get one? Well, you know, Chuck, I, I come onto the show thinking this is a friendly environment. And here you are with the gotcha questions. Oh, my bad. <laughs> no, my just, bad. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, I don't really know, to be <laughs> honest with you. I'll, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be straight up. I don't really know. But um, it's you know, kiwis are sort of like a citrus fruit. So I'm not exactly sure. Perhaps someone could drop into the comments box when they Google search this for us, what is kiwi season? And then we can share this with the rest of the group. But, you know, the other thing about kiwis is they're beautiful, right? I mean, how gorgeous is nature sometimes when we're talking about kiwis or like the perfectly ripe avocado or purple cabbage, or I'd be curious what other people would mention as beautiful food. There's tons of them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, let's crowdsource that. Let's crowdsource that. And while we're uh, looking up that info or while the exam roomies are, are helping us out, I want to say hi to uh, Mercy, who says that this has become uh, their favorite channel. They're watching in Nairobi, Kenya. That's pretty cool. Molly says that they have been one year whole food plant based thanks to the exam room live. Uh, thanks, Chuck. Thanks, Dr. B. That's awesome. Uh, happy one year anniversary, I guess, Molly. Fantastic. Nadine says that uh, they are doing the Microbiome 21 Challenge right now, learning a lot and loving my plants, they say. I'm sure you get a ton of feedback like that, right? It's been it's been quite remarkable, Chuck, and it feels really good because I put a lot of um, energy into these sort of things. Like when I do a 21-day challenge, I put a lot of personal energy into trying to make sure that it's as good as possible. We did it last year. I thought it was awesome last year. But every single time I do something like this, I'm like, yo, how can we make this better? How can we make this better? So it's basically like the parts of it that are really great. Okay, cool. Let's keep that. But the parts of it, they're like, you know what? I think we could do even better than this. Let's make those parts great too. And so we've made some uh, changes. And actually, the thing that's cool is like, the people who took microbiome 21 last year, we invited them to come back and do it again for free because I thought this would just be a fun thing if we have as many people as possible in here. Right on. I love that. Uh, a couple of people mentioned in the chat box that it turns out the Kiwi season is like roughly September to November. So it's like the fall in the United States, which actually makes a lot of sense because that's the same time that we get our citrus fruits coming. So for yep. example, my son came running in in I think it was like either late November or early December, he came running in with these oranges that grew in our orange tree. I didn't even know they were coming, but my son found them and he brought them in and they were perfect and they were the sweetest. It's amazing the difference in the flavor and how good things taste when you grow them yourself. Uh, hold on. We got to rewind that. I, I had no idea that you have an orange tree. That is awesome. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well... Uh, I became inspired, um, last year. This is my first season of having them. And basically I was like, I, I really want to have some fruit bearing trees or, or plants. And so I went, we have some places here in Charleston, South Carolina, where I went and like sort of checked out what they had. So I came home with a blueberry bush, um, two orange trees, uh, an avocado tree and a fig tree. And so it's kind of cool because, you know, we've had, we've had fresh blueberries, no avocados yet. The fig tree only produced one fig, but like, look, this is the first season. We're just getting started. It's going to be more fun to come. Dude, you're going to have to change your, your handle on IG to the fiber fueled farmer. That's epic, dude. I'm loving that. Um, let's go ahead and open up the doctor's mailbag and field some of these questions that we have here. Um, first of all, let's go back to what it was you were talking about with 
sprouts. Mary has a follow-up to that, wondering when it comes to eating sprouts every day, how much should we do? Like, is it a handful? Is it two cups? Is it three cups? How many sprouts do we need? I say the more the merrier, to be honest with you. Now, it kind of depends, Chuck, on which part we're talking about. Um, if you read my first book, Fiber Fueled, I really sort of focused on one specific type of sprouts, which are the broccoli sprouts. And that's because broccoli sprouts if you've never seen a broccoli seed before, they're the size of a sesame seed. They're so small. It's fascinating to consider that a large, mature broccoli plant grows from such a very, very small place. And when you take these seeds and you quite simply water them twice a day, and that's what you do to sprout them, and you give it five to seven days, you will grow these broccoli sprouts. And the broccoli sprouts, what's special about them? is they, they are still a source of fiber and protein and many uh, vitamins and nutrients, but they contain a concentrated source of a phytochemical called sulforaphane. And sulforaphane, Johns Hopkins actually has an entire research center dedicated just to sulforaphane because they're so enthusiastic about the research that's suggesting the benefits to sulforaphane. And if you consume broccoli sprouts, you get literally 50 to 100 times more sulforaphane than you would get from fully mature adult-sized broccoli. So like we want these broccoli sprouts to be a routine part of our diet. I recommend that you include them on a daily basis. The way that we do it in our family is that, and by the way, this includes literally this morning and yesterday and the, night, and the day before, my wife will make a smoothie for the whole family every single morning. Big smoothie. And she will throw a big old handful of these broccoli sprouts in there and you buzz it up and there is a little bit of bitterness to them, but embrace the bitter. You are fighting cancer. This is a beautiful thing. When you taste that bitterness, you know that you're on the right path. And um, so we, we put it into our smoothies. You can put it into soups. You can put it in salads. There's a lot of places you could hide broccoli sprouts. Embrace the bitter. I love that. Um, all right. This is one that came in on Instagram. Darlene sent this to me at Chuck Carroll WLC. And I will really hope that there's some sort of help here because the, the pickle that Darlene is in just sounds annoying as anything. Going back to the Kiwis being really helpful for BMs. Well, Darlene is wondering, how do you set a BM schedule? She, she sent me a message. She said, look, I have great bowel movements, but my clock is all kinds of whacked out. Is there a way to train the body to not have the need in the early hours, such as 4 or 5 a.m.? It is interrupting my beauty sleep. My goodness, what a pickle. Yeah, <laughs> that is a pickle. And, you know, I, I would say that part of the... Um, potential issue here is that if your body actually has become adapted, like accustomed to pooping at four or five in the morning, then believe it or not, your clock is currently oriented towards this and it will continue to persist as long as you continue to go to the bathroom and have this bowel movement. Let me just kind of make a, a, a comparison for the sake of people uh, understanding what I'm getting at here. If you are working during the week, and your alarm clock goes off at six in the morning, you wake up, you go to the bathroom and you go number one, right? So you take a pee. Um, you do this Monday through Friday and then it's Saturday and you would love to sleep in yet at 6 a.m. What do you do? You wake up, you go to the bathroom and you do a number one because your body has become trained. This is your rhythm. So what we need to do is we need to reorient the rhythm. And there's an interesting idea. I mean, I, we could, I, I could unpack this for probably 10 minutes with little tips and tricks, but let me just kind of give one main tip, which is that there's an interesting way to reorient your rhythm when it comes to bowel movements. It may sound juvenile in a way, like you're potty training a kid, but guess what? Our, the, the, that those techniques, they work with kids, they work with adults too. If you take the time on a daily basis, at, at, at the time that you're trying to have a bowel movement, for this person, if it's two in the afternoon, so be it. But like for most of us, it may be 8 a.m. after we have our morning coffee. You take the time, you go to the restroom, you sit down on the toilet. Don't strain. Don't force yourself to go. Just sit there in a relaxed way for five minutes. After the five minutes are up, if you have not gone, get up and walk out the door. Move on with your day. But if you do this on a routine basis, 
your body, believe it or not, starts to understand what you're trying to accomplish. And it will actually start to rev up your body and assign a rhythm that allows you to have a bowel movement at this time. This is something that I have done for people that have constipation issues. This is also a trick that I've used for people that have incontinence issues, which by the way, with incontinence, I'm talking about incontinence of the bowels. Incontinence issues are far more common than people are willing to talk about. Like you're just not going to talk to your friends about this, but there, I, I can guarantee you there are many people who are hanging out and listening right now that they've experienced this. It's embarrassing and you don't want to talk about it, but it happens. And one of the tricks is to actually establish a rhythm where you're having a good healthy, complete evacuation in the morning. And this little sit on the toilet trick for five minutes can help you do that. Speaking of constipation, we have a question from an exam room. Me watching in Oxford right now came in at 1234 says, look, I've got some constipation drama eating a vegan diet. Can nuts make you constipated? And what about tofu? Huh? <laughs> save the save the drama for your mama. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, sorry, Chuck, couldn't help myself there. Um, so let's let's talk about like nuts making you constipated or tofu. Um, you know the issue is that these foods actually. What's great about them is that they can be a great source of fiber. Fiber is a bit more nuanced than when it comes to uh, having good healthy bowel movements than perhaps the like traditional messaging has been. And I, I try to be as upfront and transparent about this as possible, even though I've written two books where fiber is literally a part of the title. It's not the catch-all solution for constipation in all cases. My approach as a gastroenterologist is this. like I, I want you to have as much fiber as possible in your diet. I want you to be eating nuts and tofu. And for some people who have mild constipation, adding nuts and tofu that will actually help them to fix their constipation and they'll have a good healthy bowel movement. But the problem is, if you are someone who has more severe constipation, you're just not moving your bowels. Adding high fiber foods for some of these people can actually make them more constipated. And the reason why is if you're not emptying, then the fiber just sits there. And it actually, it's almost like cement in a way. So what is the solution? Solution's easy. This is, this is the solution. If you are constipated, focus on getting your bowels into a rhythm first. If it's mild constipation, fiber, like these foods, water, a little bit of exercise, you'll start pooping and you should be fine. But if it's more moderate or severe constipation, you may need to work with a gastroenterologist. You may need to work with your doctor to basically address the constipation, get yourself into a rhythm. This is my way of showing things moving in rhythm through your bowels. <laughs> get yourself into a rhythm, get your bowels moving. And then once you your bowels are moving, now the nuts, the tofu, they are your friend because now when you start adding the fiber, slowly, low and slow is the tempo. When you start adding them, they actually help to maintain that rhythm, keep you in that rhythm. And then what you discover is that these foods that you thought were making your constipation worse, they're actually making your constipation better. And you may not need any medications or any other thing to keep your bowels moving because it's, you're in a flow. All right. Let's take two more rapid fire here. We've got about two minutes left. Uh, number one, I would love to do a full show on kombucha someday, but this is from David at 1235. Really quickly, is drinking kombucha good for your gut microbiome? Rapid, rapid fire answer. I think I believe that the answer is yes. It was a part of the Stanford study that I cited earlier, but it should be consumed in moderation. I like to dilute it with water so it's not too acidic. That could actually ca uh, affect the enamel of your teeth. And please don't make this the number one fermented food. There are better fermented foods than this, like sauerkraut or kimchi. Maybe so. And the final question of the day comes to us from SoGal1235. Is half an avocado a day healthy or too much fat? I think half, avocado, half of an avocado a day is healthy for the vast majority of people. I think that it's important for people to understand that just like if I were your personal trainer and we were creating a plan to make, give you the best exercise program possible, I would adapt it to your individual needs. You got a bad knee? Okay, let me make some adjustments relative to the fact that you got a bad knee. We will, we will get something that really works for you. Well, when it comes to nutrition, there is no one size fits all. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I would recommend the same thing to all people. For the vast majority of people, eating a half of an avocado a day is awesome. It's good for their health. Avocados actually have a ton of fiber. Um, are there situations where consuming uh, avocado on a routine basis could be potentially problematic? 
there are. And in those cases, it's not that I'm saying avocados are bad or harmful. Clearly, you could have worse choices. But I think that the point is like, there are some people that moderation may make sense. An example would be people who are trying to lose weight. An example would be people who have uh, diabetes and they're trying to control their blood sugar. There it is. Look, if we did not get to your question today, I promise you we will save it and do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. Dr. B, I know you're going to be back on the program next month. Maybe. I mean, I'm just going to plant the seed and say, maybe we can do it live in person together. I'm just throwing that out there. You know, it might line up that way. If I don't know, certain things line up. I don't know. I'm just putting that out there. I'm just putting it out there. Chuck, I, I, I'm not really sure what's happening right now, but I like it. <laughs> I, I, this is for the record for the people who uh, are like, okay, what, what are these guys talking about? Look, you're hearing it here first. Maybe this is happening. No, you, uh, you, you have you had no idea that this was coming. It just happened to me. We were talking about calendars a little bit before the show. And it's like, hey, let's let's just throw that out there. See if we can't make it manifest, as some people would like to say. Uh, my friend, thank you for being here, as always. And certainly the all-stars of health would not be all-stars at all without you, man. You are just absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for being here, man. Oh, man. You're the, you're the captain of the all-star team. And <laughs> I think these exam roomies who I'm like sitting here watching this chat, and you're like, yo. You guys are awesome. This chat is flying right now because you guys are so engaged. And I really love that. And it means a lot. And I just want to say, I'm excited for 2023. And I encourage all of you to take a little time, like right now, as we're getting this year off to a start, to take some time and say, okay, what do you want to do this year? That's going to make this a great year, a special year. And set those goals and let's make it happen. Let's have a great 2023 together. 1000% man, 1000%. I love where your head's at. You're in the middle of the microbiome 21. What else do you have coming up on the horizon? Well, so first of all, the microbiome 21 just started on Sunday. Um, so if people are interested and want to do it, we still have people that are enrolling. Um, and that's perfectly fine because you can come in and you can get caught up and enjoy microbiome 21 with our group. This is about building healthy habits. It's not a meal plan. There are some recipes, but it's not a meal plan. This is about taking 21 days to reflect on healthy habits and ways in which we can improve our health. And like you have to take what is being dished out in microbiome 21 and apply it to your own life. So you think about, okay, what is Dr. B saying here? And how can I use this information to basically like transform my life in 2023? Small changes when you do them repeatedly lead to massive health results. And that is what microbiome 21 is all about. So for people who are interested in that, um, you can still check it out. DM me if you need any help, but you can go to the plantfedgut.com and you'll find the information there. There it is. All right, my friend, we will talk to you again very soon. Appreciate your time today. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, everyone. All right. For everybody here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. As Dr. B said, thank you, exam roomies. You guys are just amazing. We, you guys honestly have no idea how much we love doing these shows with you. You guys make what we do so much fun and so much more impactful. So for that, I am eternally grateful. The All-Star Series rolls on tomorrow with the one and only Rip Esselstyn. We're going to all get plant strong together. And so be sure to tune in noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific for that. But until then, for everybody here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you then. Keep it plant-based. <laughs>